Welcome to the No Quit Living Podcast. Our primary objective is to motivate and inspire our listeners to never quit. The reality of life is simple. We all fall. We all fail. At times, we get knocked down. The question is, do we get back up? Are we stronger? Are we better prepared to attain the maximum of our potential? Thank you for joining our No Quit Tribe. As you go for your greatness today, never quit. And remember, we rise by lifting others up. Welcome to episode number 403 of the No Quit Living Podcast. I'm your host, Christopher J. Worth, and today's theme of the day is laughter. Our quote of the day comes to us from Milton Berle. Laughter is the best medicine in the world. If you have not subscribed to our show or left us a review, we would kindly ask if you could please do that. I know it might not seem like much, but those reviews and subscriptions help our show reach a much wider audience and grow our No Quit Tribe. I'm very excited as we have our very first comedian joining us on our show. Not only has he appeared on America's Got Talent, but I also had the opportunity to see him perform live, and I thought he was great. I think you will really enjoy Tom Cotter. I hope you enjoy today's episode. Tom, I'd like to welcome you to the No Quit Living podcast. Thank you. Honored to be here. Appreciate it. I know the answer to the first question we ask each guest is if you're ready to positively impact at least one person. And I can say that I've already had a bunch of laughs before we started recording. So I think you're definitely going to positively impact at least one person in addition to me. Excellent. I'm honored. I've tried to do more than one. So the whole premise behind our our podcast is to motivate and inspire listeners to never give up. And as a comedian, which I think is one of the most difficult industries to be in, I'm sure you have your fair share of no-quit stories, but would love if you could share one of them with our listeners today. Well, you know, comedy, I always say comedy is a dream job if you uh, dream of poverty and rejection. So it's very tough. It's a tough road to hoe. I have three sons, and I, I've already said to them, and my wife is a comic also, so they've seen the lifestyle we live, and they all say they want to try it. Uh, one says he wants to do it as a hobby, but he wants to be an engineer, and the other two, have, one of them's already tried it. So we want them to pick a more secure path, one with health insurance, dental insurance, a 401k, et cetera. None of those things come with comedy. So we are the road less traveled. I wouldn't wish it on my children. I, I hope they do try it as a hobby, but I hope they don't try to make it a career because it's very difficult. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I just, you have to persevere. You got to be Teflon in our business because it is just, it's constantly beating you down. And then someone's always going past you and you're like, why is this happening? And now with the social media revolution that we have out there now, you watch these guys who have a presence on social media and they end up filling up a comedy club, putting butts in every seat. And then people show up to see the show and they're, you know, disappointed because it's not the same as it was online. And then there are great comics who can't put butts in seats at comedy clubs. And then, you know, they, they don't get work. So it's, it's a very difficult time for, and plus you added now all the woke stuff, which I'm not bashing people over the head with political correctness, but our, our issue is, you know, comedy is now hate speech. Everyone's thinking they're going after Chappelle. They're going after Billy Burr. They're even going after Seinfeld. Uh, people are being outraged by stuff. Seinfeld. If Seinfeld's too reggy for you, then the rest of us are doomed. So it's really a tough, tough thing. My wife and I, Knockwood, have not been uh, eviscerated by people for our the content yet of our stuff. But, uh, you know, it, it's just a, it's a very difficult path. And so persevering and never giving up is all part of what we do every day. You know, I think you touch on something that is that is interesting and not to to say that decades ago and comedians didn't deal with it, but I think from the social media perspective, it's opened up just Pandora's box in regard to what people can see, but more importantly, what they can say. And and like I said, I, I can't tell you what it was like being a comedian in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and 90s. But the difference there was it was marketing and it was advertising. And now it's this social media. And like you said, it's the competition of who's good, who's the best, who's filling up um, arenas, and, and who's not. And I don't want to say that it's it's not about the actual talent of the of the comedians, but I'm curious to get your perspective because I do think that in some of that there's 
more along the lines of who's really good at the social media perspective in addition to being a great comedian? Well, you know, it's changed. When I started, and I've been at this for 35 years, when I started, you had a tape and it was a VHS tape and that was your golden ticket. And you would send that tape out by old snail mail. We didn't have the internet back then. So, you know, everyone would say, send me a tape, send me a tape. That's how you would audition for things. And then occasionally some producer or talent agent or manager was in the crowd and they'd see you and come up and give you their business card. And that's kind of how you'd network. Now with social media, you have these you know, people on social media that have, uh, you know, a great social media presence. They're young, they're hip, they know exactly what they're doing, uh, how to work the algorithms, uh, how to get their stuff to go viral. And then you have comics that are really great that have been doing this for so long that still have black and white headshots and still have, you know, a horrible website. So we've had to adjust with the with the changing tides. We've gone from that video cassette. We went to DVDs. Then you sent out DVDs. And now you go, you send out a link and you say, everyone, check out my link. And now, you know, people see you when they don't even want to see you because it comes across <laughs> the feed. So it's just that the landscape has changed so much over the last 35 years in our business that uh, that and then the content issue, you know, uh, Joan Rivers could not survive today. Uh, Don Rickles, I don't think, could survive today. They would have been canceled because their stuff was kind of edgy. Not good. I'm not that edgy a guy. I have some edgy jokes that I can pull out when I need to, but uh, I worked this summer, I worked at Bush Gardens four shows a day in front of little tiny kids all the way up to their great grandparents of every race, creed and culture. And I had to be squeaky clean for that show, Disney clean. Uh, so I can get away with it. Um, some comics who are friends of mine are just edgy people. I think they're hysterical, but they're not allowed to work at some, some venues and they've limited themselves by being that edgy, but that's the, Path they've chosen. I'm not condemning that. I'm just saying that's you know the nature of the beast. So I don't know. It's just it's, it's again. It's this changing landscape, and I'm sorry to whine about the current state of comedy, but uh, you know we're having to adapt and overcome like the Marines, and that's what we're doing. You know, I, and I really appreciate your your take on it because I think it is challenging, and and with technology and the internet and social media, things today are changing from six months ago, a year ago. And I think the reality is you, myself, anybody that's doing anything in a public space, you have to stay ahead of the curve if you want to stay, I don't want to use the word relevant, but in some ways relevant. And I think to your point, you have to now almost cater your presentations and your speech and your and your comedy to literally any and everybody, as opposed to in the past, some of the comedians you mentioned you know, they kind of had their way and it was either, you know, you liked it, you hired them or you didn't. But now it's almost like you have to have seven different shows for seven different crowds. I do. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's all C's. We say it's a corporate college cruise ship casino and comedy club. And those are pretty much your venues during the summer. You might have country clubs, but to work at a corporation now, if, if you're a corporate buyer, Chris, let's say you're you work at uh, Exxon and you're having their annual meeting and you want to hire entertainment. Would you want to roll the dice on a comedian that might get, you know, a little edgy and might have some people flip out and get triggered and run to HR? Or do you want to go with the Bee Gees tribute band? You're probably going to go with the Bee Gees tribute band because they're not controversial. They're not going to ruffle anyone's feathers. And so, you know, it's hurt us in the corporate world. We've, we've seen a, a death and that's a lot of my work. But, you know, people are nervous and they're reluctant to roll the dice on a comedian or, uh, you know, someone that might get someone in trouble or might get someone fired. And colleges, as I said before, we used to love going to colleges. They were the best because that's you could say anything at a college back in the day. Now the pendulum has swung so far that even Seinfeld wrote an op-ed to the New York Times saying that he doesn't want to work at colleges anymore because these kids show up with this chip on their shoulder and they're waiting for you to utter the one thing that's going to send them into a tizzy. And then again, they go online and they eviscerate you. And then people who weren't even in the same area code jump in and they want to be part of the spray. And if Seinfeld, again, if he's too much for you, then it's really a, a tough thing for the state of comedy. And then the other thing is, you know, where are we now where Will Smith doesn't like a joke? He will walk up on national television in front of 30 million viewers and smack Chris Rock because he doesn't like a joke. What? Where has that ever happened before? I, I it, so I, it's just it's a it's just a weird dynamic right now when we're trying to survive in it. And 
you know, I, I, I'm not a big social media guy, but I have a video right now that's kind of gone a little viral and I didn't anticipate it would. I just, it was a bit from that I was doing in my act and it went viral. So thank God I've got that going. But there are a lot of guys that are my level, my age, that have been doing this for a long time that don't have something to keep them, as you say, relevant. Uh, and so, you know, we're just, it's, uh, it, it's uh, a constant struggle. So with that in mind, I, I'm curious, and obviously you've got uh, a great presence, and I've, I've enjoyed our, our conversation prior to recording, but especially during this, this pandemic, but also just in general day to day, how do you stay so positive and upbeat, especially in such a challenging world where you've probably been told no thousands of times more than you've been told yes? Maybe there's somebody listening or watching this that's really struggling in, in maybe the same field or a totally different field, but wanted to get your perspective on how you maintain just who you are, what you do, and just getting after it each and every day. Well, Chris, I love what I do. I adore what I do, and I, I assume you adore what you do, and that's why I'm sticking with it. Uh, you know, if the pandemic didn't kill us, nothing will, because <laughs> the, pand the pandemic crushed us. We couldn't have an audience, and, and not just comedians, all entertainers. Anybody with a live audience was decimated during the pandemic. My income dropped 80% because I couldn't, we did a lot of Zoom shows, and Zoom shows, you know, thank God I did a fair amount of those. But they, they're not the same. I listen to babies crying and dogs barking. I had to listen to a guy argue with his pizza delivery guy over the tip. And as you know, on Zoom, the loudest voice takes over the meeting. And we all had to sit there and listen to this argument for five minutes, literally. And it was just horrible. I hated I did a Zoom show that was so bad, people left their own houses. So <laughs> I... I, the only thing I liked about the Zoom shows was the uh, the commute. Other than that, it was horrible. It paid a fraction of what we used to make, and they weren't as you know they just weren't live shows. And then when we could do live shows, uh, they were outdoors with people socially distanced. And I did one on a golf course, and by the time I got up on stage, they had footlights beaming up on me for stage lights. Well, I was attacked by moths and mosquitoes for the last fifteen minutes of my act. I'm you know doing this. But I was happy to have a live audience. I didn't care. Uh, so, yeah, we uh, during the pandemic, we took a beating because we, we were non-essential. They kept saying, you're non-essential. My mother-in-law prefers the term useless, but it was hurtful for us. Uh, but we survived. And again, you know, most comics marry someone with uh, a 401k and a dental plan. I didn't. My wife didn't. We're both artists. So it was really challenging. Both had twins in college that year too. They, they're sophomores now, but coming out of a pandemic and paying two college tuitions, very difficult, but we've somehow made it work because we just, you know, we work really hard. My wife works really hard and I work really hard. And, uh, you know, we have a good team around us, good managers, good agents. And so we're persevering. So if someone out there is thinking, you know, this is a, a daunting career path, it is, but embrace it. It'll, it'll be a lot of fun. And if you make it out on the other side, which we have, uh, you know, we're all power to you and it's a great life. I love that advice. And, and all jokes aside, I think not to quote what you said, but if, if this pandemic didn't kill you, I, I don't think anything literally physically can or, or will. Interesting question we, we ask each guest is if you had to define yourself, but you could only choose one word, what word would you choose? Short. <laughs> really short. I make cookies on a hollow tree. And people say to me, they come up to me after the show all the time. Honestly, God, this is the number one thing they say to me. We did when I did AGT, once you complete AGT, you they own you. You sign something early on saying in the unlikely event you make the finals, they own you. So I had to go do this dog and pony show in Vegas for four months. Uh, and it, I, I didn't want to be there. None of the other acts wanted to be there, but we were contractually obligated. And it, you know, uh, it was it was difficult to be there. I didn't. I, I, I was away from my family. I was away. From, other people were with the only ones. The dog act that beat me were the only act that was happy to be there. Everybody else was miserable and bitter. Um, but you know, I, I you know, you gotta you gotta persevere and you gotta keep going. But people would come up to me after that live show and they'd say, "Hey, you looked a lot taller on TV," which is basically saying, "Hey, you're a midget. You're you're a dwarf," and uh, which is fine. But no, uh, I. That's me being a joke about me being short. I am short. Uh, I would say one word that defines me is perseverance. A lot of guys would have quit what I've done a long time ago, even before the pandemic. My dad wanted me to be a lawyer. 
All my friends have much better jobs than I do economically. Um, but I chose this path and, and this is what I wanted to do. I told my dad when I got out of college, I said, I'm going to take the LSATs and I'll go to law school. And I just want to get this comedy thing out of my system. And that was over three decades ago that I said that and it's never gotten out of my system. And I'm glad I did it. And I love that. And I, and I think so many people chase a job or a career for for something that maybe doesn't mean anything to them. And I'm not knocking anybody as far as career choices, but it's not just about the economics. It's not, it's not just about what that title is or what your business card says. And I'm sure a lot of people have said to you in some way, shape or form how, oh, there's something that they've always wanted to do. And I wanted to be a comedian or a singer or what have you. And and I think the reality is we can't be everything. And, and I think everybody here can't be the best at everything. But I truly believe, and we always talk about this quite often, is that everybody has some level of greatness within them. And the challenge always is, are you willing to put in the work not only to find it, but then when you identify that area where you where you are great, are you willing to put in that that work and be consistent with it? And I think all jokes aside, when you talk about a 35 plus year career, you've put in the work behind the scenes to, to get you to where you are today. Well, you have to, you know, it's Darwinism, unfortunately, only the strong survive and uh, the, the pandemic thin the herd. I mean, a lot of people got out of the business. They couldn't handle it anymore. They had to take on a day job. And then they realized, you know, uh, maybe comedy isn't. I just had someone call me yesterday. People every year when AGT comes around looking at people, they call me because they know I, I did it. And they say, should I do it? Not once, Chris, not once have I said, don't do it. To every comic that's asked me in every year of multiple comics, um, I say, where else are you going to get an opportunity to get in front of a primetime audience that's a huge audience? We all do late night. We all do Leno, Letterman, Conan. But that's 5 million people, if you're lucky, in the demographics. And they're falling asleep. Whereas primetime, you know, it's 20. Our worst, our worst rating my season was 13 million. And that was for a rerun, an episode. So the numbers are staggering. And I tell everybody, go for it. You got to go for it. It sounds so trite. But if you don't try... Uh, you'll never succeed. And if, if 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 this is what you want to do, if this is your passion, what it, no matter what it is, in my case, comedy, you got to take the blows. You got to go up there and just be Teflon, take the beatings. And God, I've had some beatings. I've had some horrible shows where I've went, I just want to go back and lick my wounds and, and quit. But then you say, no, I'm going to get back on the saddle and do it again, because this is what I love to do. And it truly is what I love to do. So with that in mind, I got to ask you, do you have a, a story of just one of, if not the worst shows you ever did, not from your end, but whether it was in front of like five people that were sleeping or just something that you could share to to make our audience laugh? Do we have eight hours? I uh, <laughs> I work in Florida a lot. You know, it's God's waiting room. And there's there are a lot of gated <laughs> communities down there and they love having comedians. They're nostalgic for their their their, their, their when they were younger, the cat skills. You know, Lucy and Desi, uh, Dean Martin, the Rat Pack, they, they're very nostalgic for that. So they love having comedians. And thank God, because that's a lot of my business during the winter. And it's not hard to get me on a plane to come down to Florida during January and February. But I, I do these gigs and there are people all the time, not just falling asleep. But first of all, they have a lot of them. They're, they're in their late hundreds, some of these people. And they shuffle in and they sit down in the front row and they fall asleep. And God bless them. They didn't get up and walk out, but it's the most passive aggressive thing in the world to, to fall asleep in the front row of a comedy club. But they're very elderly. They can't laugh because they have oxygen masks on. They can't clap because they have arthritis. They can't give you a standing ovation because they have bad hips. Uh, they'll say to you after the show, they'll, you'll think you had the most horrible show in the world. And then the guy will come backstage and say, we can't wait to have you back next year. I'm not gonna, wait, did you see what just happened? There were tumbleweeds blowing through the crowd. And the guy will say, well, they didn't get up and leave. If they hate you, they get up and leave because they're old and they realize they don't have much time left on the planet. So they're not going to sit there and watch someone they hate. So the fact that they stayed in the room uh, means, and I'm like, really? But uh, those, God, I've had a million. I did a prom show. I don't want to take up your whole time. I did a prom show. You know, after proms in New York City, parents organize these events so their kids are in a safe environment and so one of them was a little uh cruise around the statue of liberty i did that my senior year as well many do it's you know to keep kids uh engaged and and away from alcohol allegedly well they put two high schools 
One was from Westchester. One was this kind of preppy group of kids. And the other one was from the Bronx and they were not preppy and they hated each other the second they got on the boat. So they were staring at each other in tuxedos, you know, like they wanted to go to battle. And then they gave me a microphone and they want me to make them all laugh and they already hate each other. And the, the microphone they give me is a battery handheld microphone and the battery sucks. So it keeps going in and out. The only good microphone the DJ has in the booth and my microphone's going out and he's heckling me. And I can't even go back at him because my microphone's not working. Had the worst show in the world. I wanted to jump off the ship and swim ashore. but there And there was no place to hide. I had to go to the engine room of this ferry, this stupid little ferry that went around the, and hide. And it was a billion degrees. And if I didn't quit after that, there's no quitting. I mean... That's, I mean, I wasn't there, but the way you described it, it sounds like a, a fantastic night. It was the worst. And they wanted the kids not to drink. I, I saw countless kids vomiting over the side. They were all <laughs> drinking. They were all, it, was, uh, it was just such a nightmare. I think I made $75 for that ordeal. And I was there the entire night uh, till the sunrise. That's when we went back in. That sounds like a blast. So an interesting question, and I'm super intrigued to to get your answer on this. I'm um partly scared to ask it, but the famous Jim Rohn quote, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. If I could grant you dinner with any five people, dead or alive, to have dinner with, who would you pick? George Carlin, um, Rodney Dangerfield, Johnny Carson, showing you my age with those three. Uh, And then I really liked Ronald Reagan. He was my favorite president when uh, I was in college when he was a president and I thought the world of him. I, I still do. So I will pick Ronald Reagan. And my fifth sounds sappy, but I, I really enjoy my wife's company. And uh, so and she's a comedian, a fellow comedian. We have a great relationship. Um, we'll never get divorced because, frankly, neither one of us wants custody of the children. So um, <laughs> I, I will pick my to, to keep my marriage safe. She will be my number five, but she's really my number one. That is awesome. So wanted to ask you, you shared, you just shared a couple comedians that, that are, I guess, from the older generation. If you could watch or pay for, for comedians right now, curious, who, who do you enjoy listening to or watching? And have you also ever had the opportunity to perform with them? Uh, yeah, I, I, I get to meet Carlin. Um, I never met Dangerfield. I never met Carson. When I did The Tonight Show, it was Jane Leno. Carson had already passed. Um, so those are the, I, when I grew up, those are the ones I really looked up to. Those are, you know, I listened to Eddie Murphy, uh, a little bit in college, but before that I had discovered Carlin and Richard Pryor and I would listen to their albums. This is how long ago it was. We had record albums in a secret room up on the third floor of our house with like a blanket over us. Cause if my parents heard the vowel, foul language that was coming out of their mouths, they would have killed me. Um, but yeah, so I, I listened to them a lot, uh, current you know, I, I, I they're not current. Two of my favorites have passed recently way too early, and that was Mitch Hedberg and Greg Giraldo. I think they're both really hysterical people. But current, alive, I'd say Stephen Wright. I'm a one-liner guy, and I really love uh, his stuff. Um, uh, you know, I think Dave Attell is a great writer. I love his stuff. Nick DiPaolo makes me laugh. Um, yeah, the, uh, God, there are a lot of people out there now that are really starting to, like Sebastian Maniscalco, I respect uh, the success he's had. And Billy Burr, both of them are on fire right now. And Billy's a great dude, I know, from the old days. So we kind of started together in Boston. So those are all people that I look up to. And I, uh, if people ask me who they should check out if they're bored on a plane, I say Google those guys generally. It, it's so interesting that you shared Mitch Hedberg. I, I think the, the two of you are very similar. And to, to show my age as well, my brother actually many, many years ago gave me a CD of, of Mitch. And I listened to him and I, I just said, you know, this guy's awesome. And, and I don't know what it was about his content. And, and not, don't get me wrong, I, I thought he had great content. But the way he delivered some of that stuff, and, and especially with being a one-liner, it, it reminds me a lot of you and and I had the opportunity to to see you live back in I think it was 2019 at a local show here and we talked about that briefly but I really enjoy when when people are able to do their profession at a high level and I really appreciate um what you shared about some of those some of those comedians and I I think Bill Burr is somebody that he's one of those hit or miss where you know he's he's kind of he does his own thing um, and I know a lot of people think he's a little bit over the top, but what I do respect about him is 
you know, he doesn't really change. Now, I don't know him personally in any way, shape, or form, but I just watched one of his uh, specials this morning when I was doing some cardio at the gym on Netflix, and I just think he's he's incredibly talented, and I appreciate you uh, you touching on those. So we're going to change lanes for a second, what we call our hot seat questions, and the only request we ask of you is that you spit out the first thing that comes to mind. All right. <laughs> My mind is a little cloudy, but we'll see what we can do. Last meal, you can pick absolutely anything. What do you pick? Uh, Peter Luger's steak from the original Peter Luger's in Brooklyn, um, a porterhouse uh, with the uh, accompanying sides, which are just the best. But that steak is, I'm a carnivore, and that's my, that's my go-to. Favorite smell? Uh, warm cookies, home-baked cookies. You know, when you walk into the house and someone's making cookies, that's... Uh, that's a nasal orgasm. Sorry. <laughs> Favorite sport? Now to do skiing, because I still can, but wrestling is what I did when I was younger. I uh, did a lot of, you know, when you're my height, you ride a horse or you wrestle. And I didn't have a horse, so I had to wrestle. Do you have an all-time favorite team? Yeah, you know, I, it's it's a battle. Let's see if I can show. No, I'm not wearing it now. I have a Patriots belt. I'm a New England Patriots guy because I, I, I had season tickets when they were the worst team in the league. And my dad would drag us to the stadium. It was the, the worst stadium in the NFL, and they were the worst team in the NFL. And I would get frostbite sitting on an aluminum bench. And, they would, and the urinals at the stadium were the harsh troughs. And so, you know, you had no privacy and I had nervous kidneys as a kid. And that's my memory of going <laughs> to that is not being able to pee in front of a hundred other guys. And they're like, come on, kid, let's go. And the pressure would just, so uh, horrible memories. So the fact that they got decent, present year uh, excluded, uh, the fact that they got good for a decade uh, was just, I thought, justice because of all the abuse I took during my youth. So the New England Patriots, my favorite team. Sorry to be so long. <laughs> Do you have an all time favorite movie? You know, it's kind of non. I'm, I'm a. There's a movie called The Big Chill. And again, I'm showing my age that I really stuck with me when I was a little kid. The Sound of Music. I had never seen anything like that before, and that was amazing too. And then when I was in high school, I'm giving you three. The Warriors. When I was in high school, that was Walter Hill's big first movie, and uh, I just adored it. It was about street gangs in New York. I'm not going to lie. When you said the sound of music, I really thought you were going to follow it up with a joke. And But you said it with such seriousness that I'm confused right now. The whole school went on a trip and it was a field trip to go see this movie. And I had never seen a movie. I'd never seen a musical. You know, my parents uh, did not provide culture, apparently, in my home. So my school did. And I was blown away by it. I thought it was amazing. Do you have an all time favorite book? Uh, Tom Cotter, Wise Ass. It's called No. I do have a book on Amazon. People should check it out. But um, you know what? Jay Leno wrote a book called Leading With My Chin. And it's really a heartwarming, touching story about how supportive his parents were and how he scratched and clawed getting into the comedy world. And when I got married, I gave that book out to all my groomsmen um, as a gift because I just thought it was such a great book. And it was a really an homage to his parents. His father had recently died before he penned the book, and it was really touching, great, inspirational, and I, I dug it. So there you go. A lot of people won't quote Jay Leno as their favorite author, but that particular book really hit a nerve. I can honestly say we're we're just about 400 episodes into our show, and you are the first one that has ever quoted uh, Jay Leno as an author. Yeah, there you go. What's the favorite app you have or use on your phone? Sadly, I'm showing my age. Free Cell. It's a stupid card game. Uh, it's a uh, solitaire uh, card game, and it will make me sit on an airplane and uh, have spasms of anger because I'm losing and run strangers. So uh, I play that way ad nauseum, way more than I should. And then again, lately, I'm going back in the. You know, I have a viral video right now, so I constantly have to check TikTok, Instagram, and. Um, Twitter to see the nasty comments people leave on my, my videos. And what is the background picture on your phone? On my phone? Let's look. Uh, right now it changes, but here we go. It's the fan. This is, uh, sorry, you can see my dad who's recently passed away. That's my son, Tommy. And then, uh, you know, if I zoomed it in, you'd see the other kids. I have three boys, and that's my parents with my three boys, my wife and I. So not Jay Leno, but do you have an all-time favorite quote? Quote, live long and prosper by Spock, maybe? 
And and what is that song, no matter whenever you hear it, morning, noon, or night, you just automatically tune it up and just rock out to it? Uh, Bruce Springsteen's Born to Run. I used to listen to it on my Walkman before a wrestling match. I'd have to cue it. This is back when you had a cassette, and I'd have to cue it up. And I wanted it to hit, you know, right, exactly the right time to get my all jacked up with adrenaline. And if the match went into overtime ahead of me, I'd be like, no, no, my Bruce is, it's queued up perfectly. You can't do this to me. So, yeah, uh, and that's still, that song still just, it, you know, it brings a warm and fuzzy to me that no other song can. And what's the best way for our listeners to connect with you, follow you, and also where can they get your book that you briefly mentioned before? Yeah, my book, Amazon, easiest, uh, you know, it's on other outlets too, but Amazon is the easiest. And then um, it's called Bad Dad, A Guide to Pitiful Parenting. And my wife has a book called Mean Mommy. So, you know, that our kids are in therapy. But uh, yeah, so we both have books out. And then, yeah, my website is tomcotter.com, shockingly. And I'm all over social media now. It's a necessary evil. So I'm there a lot. Uh, people should check out the video that I have out there right now. It's uh, apropos for the times. And uh, my tours are always posted either on my website or on my Facebook fan page, which uh, anyone can access. And then last question we have for you is the same question we ask everybody is if you have any parting words you'd like to leave with our listeners today. Uh, yeah, I, uh, you know, the, the concept of, of your podcast, I believe, is to never give up, never quit trying. You know, it's uh, the Jim Valvano or uh, whatever his quote. Um, and that's kind of been what I did. And on, on America's Got Talent, they painted me as this guy. I was 58 when I went on the show. And I'm sorry, 48 when I went on the show. And they said, uh, you know, don't you think you're a little past your prime to be going for this? And I kept saying, no, I, you know, it's never too late. Uh, Rodney Dangerfield didn't make it until he was in his late 50s. You know, that's when he became a big star. So uh, I tell everybody just, you know, find it. It's cliche, but find something you love to do and you'll never work a day in your life. And then once you're in that field, whatever it is, once you find your joy, just, you know, be as passionate about it as you can. And, and, and really, you know, you, you only live once. Get out there and start swinging. I love it. I, I think this is a perfect way to end today's podcast. And I truly appreciate, Tom, your time. And for our listeners out there, for our viewers, if you have not seen Tom or any of his stuff, make sure you check him out. Make sure you follow him. He's all over social media. But I truly appreciate you being here, and I hope that you and I can connect again soon. Agreed. This was fun. I appreciate it. I do a lot of these. Some of them suck. This one did not. So thank you for that. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to episode number 403. I had a blast speaking with Tom, and I hope you enjoyed listening to the podcast as much as I enjoyed recording it. In his parting words, Tom spoke about how it is never too late, and we shouldn't give up. He mentioned that he didn't make it on to America's Got Talent until the age of 48, and that Rodney Dangerfield wasn't discovered until he was well into his 50s. As we wrap up today's episode, I challenge you to keep going. You might not be where you want to be today, but you will never get to where you want to go if you quit. And remember, we rise by lifting others up. And lastly, to our listeners, thank you. We truly appreciate your time, and we hope our episodes inspire you to keep on attacking life and never giving up. To quote Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, it's always too early to quit.